Hello again, it's Mr. Kennedy with yet another video lecture. Uh, we're getting pretty close to the end of the semester. I don't know if you've looked at your calendar or not, but we are on this week right here. Week number 12, we've got two different topics to talk about. <clears throat> we've got the, the 1960s along with the Vietnam War, and then we've got the Civil Rights Movement as well. You'll also notice that next week is the last week of class. And then we have the final exam. So I want to make sure that you're looking at this calendar that's found in Blackboard. Make sure you realize there's not a whole lot of time left and you need to be working on your reflection paper. You need to be working on your SLO and start looking back at these video lectures in preparation for your final exam. I will do my absolute best to get some sort of study guide out to you, but you know right now, final is coming up. Go ahead and start re-watching these videos. Go ahead and start looking back at the PowerPoints. All right, so struggles for equality. Let's look at what's going on here. The birth of the civil rights movement goes back further than the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, you can really look at World War II in the way African Americans were treated then. And there were two very different points of view on racism after World War II ends. There's one viewpoint that says that racism is economic and class-based, and you could cure racism by bringing economic equality to everybody. But there's another group that says it's cultural and it's learned. And the only way to solve racism is through education. And these two different views on the causes of racism are going to very much shape the efforts at trying to end it. And the first big group that tries to tackles the civil rights movement and racism is going to be the NAACP. Uh, the NAACP, they took the opinion that racism could be solved through education. The biggest problem with this, though, is it put the emphasis for desegregation on African Americans. It would be up to blacks to force their way into white society and white society was in no hurry to accept them. The biggest focus of the NAACP in the 1940s and in the 1950s was on the federal government. Uh, some examples of this, um, after World War II, the NAACP put pressure on President Harry Truman to desegregate the military and eventually in 1948 that is done mainly because Harry Truman needed help from African Americans to win re-election. So the Democratic Party turns into the Party for Civil Rights in 1948 as a way to retain the White House. Another place that the NAACP is going to be busy has to do with Supreme Court cases. And in 1950, there is a Supreme Court case called McLaurin versus the Oklahoma Board of Regents. And the NAACP takes the Oklahoma Board of Regents to court. There is a gentleman who wants to get a graduate degree in education and the only place that offers that degree is Oklahoma University which was an all-white school. Because the Supreme Court rules in McLaurin's favor, George McLaurin is allowed to enroll at the University of Oklahoma and he is the first black student to attend there. There is another very famous court case called Sweat versus Painter. I don't have it on one of these slides, 
But I did want to mention it real quick. Um, sweat versus painter. In Texas, there was a an African American who wanted to go to the University of Texas and get a law degree, but there was not there were no schools in Texas that would allow African Americans to get a law degree. So what Texas tried to do was just out of thin air create a separate law school for African Americans, but the Supreme Court said no, 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 you can't do that because creating a school out of thin air is unequal and therefore does not pass the spirit of the law. Now, Brown versus Board of Education is the big one. This is in 1952. Um, and it's Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And in this court case, NAACP lawyers led by a guy named Thurgood Marshall are going to attack the separate but equal concept found in Plessy versus Ferguson from 1896. Thurgood Marshall is going to use sociological studies, psychological studies, research, and he's going to argue that separate schools are not equal just because of all of the stigma and resources and treatment of the students in the different schools being different. As a result of this Brown versus Board of Education court case, the Supreme Court rules unanimously that segregated schools were unequal and ordered schools to desegregate. The problem with this court case though is they never said when it has to be done so there is a second court case, Brown versus Board of Education Part Two, in 1955 that states that schools must desegregate with all deliberate speed, meaning right away. Uh, the reaction to this in the government was interesting. In 1955, Dwight D. Eisenhower was president. Uh, he did not support the Supreme Court uh, he publicly says that uh, making Judge Earl Warren a Supreme Court judge was his worst mistake ever. And President Eisenhower orders federal agencies such as the FBI and the Department of, Department of Urban Housing to actively work against desegregation. You even have Southern congressmen who block legislation. And 100 of these Southern members of Congress signed something called the Southern Manifesto, where they say that the Brown versus Board of Education court ruling was, quote, a clear abuse of judicial power. Now, because governor, or not governor, but because President Dwight D. Eisenhower doesn't really support desegregation and in some ways is actively against it. Southern states think it's okay to openly resist desegregation and they begin this system of massive resistance. There are state governments that argue that the federal government is interfering with states' rights and because the federal government was interfering with states' rights, state governments began to pass laws banning desegregation, thinking that they were protecting their residents. Now, never mind the fact that the argument about states' rights was solved with the Civil War, that doesn't stop the South in the 1950s from trying to bring that up again. The focus of this massive resistance can really be seen in Little Rock, Arkansas. In 1957, the school board of Little Rock, Arkansas, are tr they try to follow the Brown versus Board of Education ruling. They're ordered by a local federal court to desegregate the schools. Well, the governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, 
he's openly opposed to desegregation and when nine african-american students attempt to attend central high school for the first time governor faubus actually calls out the arkansas national guard who then point guns and bayonets at these students to keep them out of the high school the local federal court is going to order governor faubus to remove the national guard but he refuses and he encourages and organizes a mob to attack the students when they come back the next day this eventually gets TV time and it gets in the news and only when things start to look bad does President Eisenhower nationalize the National Guard and then has the National Guard keep peace in Little Rock as well as help these nine students into the school so just to be clear the National Guard that was originally keeping these students out of the schools by pointing guns at them suddenly have to escort the same students into the school and protect them with guns. Well, the next school year to prevent desegregation, Governor Faubus is going to order not just Central High School closed, but all schools in Little Rock, Arkansas as well as the state of Arkansas to be closed. When Governor Faubus orders all schools to be closed, other states throughout the South begin to do the same thing. So school closings becomes this argument, this crisis between the New South and, and the Old South. And this campaign is created called Save Our Schools or SOS and the SOS campaigns are going to argue that schools should be open not for desegregation but because students should be taught no matter what. So eventually the schools are going to be reopened even though it's not by choice. Now what about desegregation in Georgia? Uh, the first school in Georgia, or the school system in Georgia to desegregate is the Atlanta Public School System. The APS is going to desegregate in 1961. Also, in 1961, the first African American students are going to attempt to attend the University of Georgia. Hamilton E. Holmes and Sherlane Hunter uh, now today, Sherlane Galt are allowed to attend UGA only after a federal court orders the president of UGA to allow them in. Uh, just like in Little Rock, UGA is temporarily closed to prevent these two students from attending. It is eventually forced open. Uh, the law students at UGA are going to organize a well-planned out riot and when Sherlene Hunter enters her dorm room, these law students and these rioters are going to throw rocks at her dorm room window. The window breaks, the campus police show up. They don't stop the riot and eventually state troopers come in and the state troopers are going to take one student into custody and that one student that is arrested is Sherlane Hunter for creating a riot. Now a little closer to home for me because I'm a two-time UWG graduate, uh, University of West Georgia. Uh, the first African American to attend there was Lillian Williams. She's personally invited to attend by the president of UWG. There are no riots. There are no incidents. She's allowed to attend school without any issue. And Lillian Williams is gonna become not only the first African-American graduate of West Georgia, but she's also gonna become the first master's graduate of West Georgia as well. Eventually, massive resistance is going to come to an end. Um, African-American students try to attend Ole Miss. And when these black students attend Ole Miss, 
there are actual gunfights that break out between U.S. Marshals and rioters. Some of the students are actually killed there at Ole Miss. But the University of Alabama is desegregated in 1963 almost with no problem. And if once the University of Alabama becomes desegregated in 1963, massive resistance starts to end. Um, with that being said, though, most of this desegregation is going to happen in the larger cities. Small cities, small towns, small counties, uh, they don't desegregate until they're forced to after 1964. Now, mass black civil rights movement is going to begin in the 1950s. And if you want to point to one start, one spark, if you will, December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks refuses to move any further back on a segregated bus. Rosa Parks had worked all day. She just sits down in the first seat she can in the women's section of the bus. And because she refuses to move to the absolute last seat of the bus, she is arrested by Montgomery, Alabama police, and she's charged with breaking the law. She's eventually going to be found guilty. She receives a fine of $14, and in 2020 money, that'd be $136. The night that Rosa Parks is arrested, there is a community organization formed called the Montgomery Improvement Association. The Montgomery Improvement Association, along with the Women's Political Council, are going to boycott the Montgomery bus system. And eventually, a new preacher in town Martin Luther King Jr. will become the president of this Montgomery Improvement Association. Now, the main reason that King is chosen is because he's new to Montgomery. Uh, he's seen as a neutral voice, and he's a very eloquent speaker. The Montgomery Improvement Association, they have three demands. Demand one, first come, first serve seating in segregated sections. When Rosa Parks was arrested, the buses were segregated into both black and white sections, but then white men, white women, black men, black women, there was that separation as well. So yes, blacks were at the back of the bus, but black women were at the very, very back of the bus. So the Montgomery Improvement Association says, we'll keep segregated sections, but let women sit wherever they want within their section. The next thing that they want, courteous bus drivers. Be nice to people. And the third thing, hire bus drivers who are black when it's a predominantly African-American route. The Montgomery Improvement Association says we will continue to boycott buses until these three demands are met. Well, the two sides almost reach an agreement. But Montgomery didn't operate their own buses. They contracted their bus system from a company out of Detroit, Michigan. Montgomery was willing to desegregate in the way that they wanted to, or that they wanted. But the bus company in Detroit refused to hire a black bus driver. So this boycott is going to last a year until the two sides can work it out. Now Martin Luther King Jr., who is he? Uh, we talk a lot about him, but a lot of people don't really go into detail. Uh, Mr. King, he became the leader of the Civil Rights Movement almost by fate, if you will. Uh, his family was a long line of preachers at the Ebenezer Baptist Church here in Atlanta. He went to Morehouse College. He went on to Crozier Theological Seminary School. And then eventually 
he gets his doctorate from Boston University. Now, he felt that Christian law or moral law overrode any man-made law there was. So he's basing his arguments on Christianity, the idea of loving your neighbor, etc., etc. And he said it was your duty as a person to obey a moral law, to obey a higher law, even if it conflicted with laws of government. He also believed that violence should never be used to support moral law. Um, he, he says that violence is not Christian-like. But he was not afraid to get in people's faces. He was not afraid to make people face the irrationality of segregation by confronting them and making them think. And this idea of confronting racism head on and making people think about their choices, he called creative tension. The best way to create this creative tension is to develop a mass movement, get media attention, and make people think openly about the choices they were making. When we get into the early 1960s, we get the sit-in movement. In fact, February 1960, uh, students in Greensboro, North Carolina at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College uh, are going to sit at the whites only section of a lunch counter at a store called Woolworths. Uh, Woolworths was a department store kind of like a modern day department store but then it also had a lunch counter that was similar to like a waffle house but whites only could sit in a certain section of the lunch counter and in february in february 1960 four african-american students sit down at the whites only lunch counter they refused to move in response to this the store manager shuts down the, the lunch counter. Well, the next day, a larger group of black students sit down at the counter, take up all the seats, and the store manager closes the lunch counter again. And this continues for days and days and days, and eventually, women from the local Greensboro Women's College there in North Carolina will join these black male students. And there are several weeks of the lunch counter being closed daily. Woolworths begins to lose a lot of money and Woolworths is forced to integrate their lunch counters. Once it becomes obvious that this is working, these sit-ins spread throughout the region. North Carolina and Virginia also have their sit-ins and additional stores are forced to open their counters to African Americans. Now there are three civil rights organizations that you must know. The first one is the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This is the group that's led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Its goal was to organize black youth and it's based in black churches, specifically Baptist churches. And you could even say that Ebenezer Baptist Church was kind of their headquarters. Uh, the SCLC is going to go to Greensboro, North Carolina, NCANT, and they're going to try and help to organize the students, but the students kind of want to do it themselves. So this, there's a student group that's formed called SNCC, S-N-C-C, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It's founded by a woman named Ella Parks, who is a helper of Dr. King. And SNCC tries to organize the sit-ins, but it doesn't really work. Um, and because the sit-ins don't work the way SNCC wants, uh, SNCC is going to kind of pivot and refocus and become a, a voting rights group. Uh, the job of SNCC is going to be to 
go into rural areas, organize rural voting efforts for African Americans, and try and change the civil rights through the ballot box. Last but not least, you have CORE, uh, the Congress of Racial Equality. It was created by a gentleman named James Farmer. And CORE is going to be involved with multiple events in civil rights, but the best known is the Freedom Rides. And what happens in the Freedom Rides, they begin in 1962. Uh, students and members of CORE are going to challenge the South on segregated interstate buses. Uh, the U.S. government ruled that interstate travel could not be segregated, but the South ignored that, and when a bus came into a southern bus station, the riders on the bus were ordered to rearrange themselves into segregated sections. And when riders on the bus refused to move, uh, these bus riders were often met with violent mobs, the police, and the KKK. These bus riders were very often arrested and thrown into jail. And by the way, these violent mobs were very often instigated and created by the police and the KKK working together. A movement that's organized by SNCC but has members of CORE, the NAACP, and the SCLC involved as well, it's the Mississippi Freedom Summer of 1964. This is going to be a massive voter registration drive that happens throughout Mississippi. and. That's why it's called the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Uh, white college students, black college students work together to organize voting in the South. They're going to try and integrate Southern communities through this. SNCC, they're going to think that the best way to get attention is if Northern white kids are the ones who are doing these voter registration drives. So SNCC is going to train these college students how to act, how to react. And eventually, both black and white college students are going to go to Mississippi. And the worst event that happens is going to be at Philadelphia, Mississippi, where there's a riot and a shootout. There's going to be three student workers who were killed, one black student worker, two white student workers. The guy who was president in 1964, Lyndon B. Johnson, is going to send the FBI to Mississippi to investigate the murders. And the reason the FBI is sent to investigate the murders is because the local police and the state police do nothing. Six men are eventually accused of murder. When those six men go to trial in the state courts, nothing happens. And eventually, these six men are going to be arrested by the FBI and tried in federal court. And by the way, the people who are arrested, the county sheriff, and several deputies. And surprisingly, the county sheriff and two deputies are the ones who are going to be found guilty of murder. By the time the Mississippi Freedom Summer is over, there's massive violence. Homes have been bombed and burned. People have been beat. Murders have happened. Over a thousand volunteers are arrested. Almost a hundred workers beaten. Almost 40 churches firebombed. And multiple black owned homes and businesses are burned down. You have to look at 1965 as well, and this is an event that has been in the news in the past couple months because of the passing of Congressman John Lewis, and that is the March on Selma, Alabama. Uh, 
Uh, this was the last great effort by SNCC, really, in 1965. And it was to organize a march from the city of Selma to the city of Montgomery. That was a 54-mile hike. And it was supposed to start on March 7th and go to March 25th. Uh, the plan was to walk from Selma to Montgomery to protest the murder of an African-American man. But when the marchers get to the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, uh, Selma they're met by Sheriff Jim Clark of the local police department. And Sheriff Jim Clark, along with the Alabama State Patrol, are going to tell these marchers to turn around and go back where they came from. These marchers stand there. They don't advance. They don't retreat. They stand there peacefully. And Sheriff Jim Clark orders an attack on the marchers. It's all caught on TV. You can go right now to YouTube and you can see video of this happening. The events are captured on national news. The story spreads throughout the United States. And it is the march on Selma that gets Congress to pass the 1965 Voting Rights Act. This event becomes known as Bloody Sunday because of how violent it was. Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC are going to launch a series of nonviolent demonstrations in Birmingham to try and get the city to desegregate their public facilities. Uh, the police commissioner of Birmingham, Eugene Bull Connor, is going to personally supervise the efforts to break up the marches. And Connor is going to order the police to use police dogs, tear gas, clubs, cattle prods, fire hoses, anything they can to break up the marches in Birmingham, Alabama. TV cameras are there to catch everything. All the violence is broadcast onto the national news. These televised protest activities brought the civil rights really for the first time outside the South and made people start to pay attention, which is why the March on Selma two years later was so impactful. Um, demonstrations spread to a no number of other cities in April of 1963, but most of that was in support of Birmingham. But despite the news coverage, despite the protest around the country, Birmingham doesn't change. Finally, as like a last ditch effort, a desperate move, if you will, uh, King is going to allow school children to join the march. And Bull Connor orders the police to treat the school children the same way they've treated everybody else. So there are videos of high school kids, elementary school kids, middle school kids getting bit by police dogs, having tear gas thrown at them, being beaten by clubs. Morale in the police department is going to collapse when the police are forced to use violence against children because it's not what they were hired to do. And eventually, the imagery is so bad that the white leadership of Birmingham, Alabama is forced to speak to and compromise with the civil rights marchers. Now very famously is the March on Washington. That's also August 1963. Uh, over 250,000 demonstrators are going to go to the mall in Washington, D.C. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Washington, D.C. I will say that if you've never been, you should go. It's an amazing city. But there were so many people who attended the March on Washington. The speeches were done at the Lincoln Memorial, and the people stretched all the way back to the Washington Monument and further. 
almost to where the Smithsonian Institute is. This March on Washington is where the I Have a Dream speech took place. One of the best speeches in the history of America, really. This march, this speech, I Have a Dream, that's going to be kind of the high point of the Civil Rights Movement. It leads to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And it really changed the world we live in today. Now what happens though? Um, the movement doesn't go as far as most people like and the movement doesn't solve all the problems. One of the big reasons is because the civil rights movement was never truly unified. Each of the different groups involved in the civil rights movement, SNCC, CORE, the NAACP, the SCLC, the National Urban League, they all had different goals, they all had different methods, they all had different groups that they were associating with or different schemes, different ways. So no matter what was done, nothing actually became unified. And in some cases, these groups actually worked against each other because of competition. The NAACP, the National Urban League, they remain conservative. Uh, SELC is kind of your middle of the road. SNCC and CORE are going to go on to become very radical. In 1965, there are huge riots in the Watts district of LA. And that's despite the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and that's despite the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And many asked why blacks were burning down central LA when they had won such big victories in Congress. And the most common answer was, it didn't do anything for me. The condition of the people living in the inner cities didn't change. In 1966, Martin Luther King is going to go to Chicago to protest in the city about African Americans wanting and demanding better housing. Marches in Chicago were met with widespread resistance from whites and from blacks who didn't want to be nonviolent. When the march made it to the south suburb of Cicero, African-Americans and whites confronted each other and a little bit of violence breaks out. By the time Martin Luther King Jr. is done in Chicago, he's gonna go on record and say that white hatred in Chicago was worse than anything he experienced in Alabama. Because at least in Alabama, they were racist to your face. There's a march in Mississippi in June of 1966 where members of SNCC, members of CORE, members of the SCLC are all participating. Martin Luther King Jr. and his people are shouting freedom now. The SNCC leader, Stokely Carmichael, and CORE begins shouting black power. So in the middle of the march, a debate begins between the leaders of CORE and SCLC on what the purpose of the march was for and what the purpose of the movement was for. And before you know it, the Black Power Movement begins, it becomes increasingly militant and violence starts to tick up. Before you know it, from there, you have the formation of the Black Panthers by Bobby Seals, Eldridge Cleaver, and Huey Newton. And it's gonna become a military esque organization and the Black Panthers are going to openly battle police in the streets. 
So by 1968, the civil rights movement is kind of at this impasse. There's no further momentum. Riots continue throughout the cities of the United States. In 1966, there were 43 major riots. In 1967, there were eight major riots. And then when we get to 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. And many people say that when Martin Luther King is assassinated on April 4th, 1968, that the civil rights movement died with him. So, a little bit of a depressing video here, but it is a good one. And the readings for this lecture, specifically Martin Luther King Jr.'s Power of Nonviolence, absolutely probably my favorite reading in this entire semester. All right, that's it for now. We'll see you in the next video on the 1960s. Bye-bye.